So good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here. Um, I know that for uh, many of the students, these are supposed to be your holidays. So um, mate, you've made a great choice, though, to, to spend those holidays with us. Uh, at least I hope you agree by the end of the week that that's the case. Um, we're really excited to, to have you um, with us, uh, all of you from wherever you've come, uh, and also those uh, of you who are online all around the world to, to dial into the different uh, talks um, and uh, uh, activities that we've got um, planned for you for this week. Um, the microengineering um, school, as I'm told to call it because it's not winter, <laughs> it's usually the microengineering winter school, but we've moved it because of some brand new uh, refurbishment that happened of our laboratories. And so you will be the first um, microengineering uh, school participants that will step into our uh, extended and expanded um, clean rooms, as well as to be able to see some of our brand new uh, machining um, capabilities that we've got here on campus. And so um, I hope uh, you enjoy um, that experience and it'll be well worth the wait to spring to be able to participate in that. Um, my name's Craig Priest. Uh, I am the director of the South Australian node of the Australian National Fabrication Facility, which is quite a long name. And you'll hear people talk about ANFF or ANFF SA. Um, uh, during the week quite a bit. You can see it up there, ANFFSA, so that's the South Australian node. Um, I've, I lead a team of really excellent um, fabrication experts here at UniSA and across to um, Flinders as well. Uh, our node uh, is across two universities here in South Australia and we work very closely together. Um, we also have great links into um, DST and industry, and so you'll even have a chance to rub shoulders with some of our uh, experts from out of DST in uh, your practice and in your presentations, and so um, catch up with them over coffee. You might wonder why you, you didn't have to pay anything to come to this school, which is probably a bit unusual, usually, you know, pay per view sort of thing, but um, there's a really good reason for that. We we actually want to give this uh, opportunity to those who are interested to be able to upskill and, and get acquainted, acquainted with some really high tech capabilities. And so um, this is a, uh, a team effort. <clears throat> Everyone who speaks to you is uh, really volunteering their time and, 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 uh, and it's amazing how passionate the team is about um, putting on this school. And so you will see uh, different organisations involved, different academics from around the country um, uh, during, the, during the week. And, and uh, it's a great opportunity to, to engage with people from all over Australia uh, and, in fact, uh, over the world as well. So take the chance to uh, interact and uh, get to know people. So um, we hope you enjoy the school. A couple of formalities. Um, so other than, uh, the, well, it's not a formality, sorry, after this there'll be formalities. Um, but I do want to um, acknowledge that we're on uh, the lands of the Ghana people. Uh, and so uh, this land is, is uh, the traditional lands of the Ghana people and we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and that they're <clears throat> Excuse me, and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still important to the living um, Ghana people today. And of course, there's a long tradition of uh, teaching from generation to generation and knowledge sharing, which is um, which we also acknowledge today that we participate uh, in sharing knowledge uh, as has been done on these lands for many, many years. And so um, we respect and uh, acknowledge that today. So now to the formalities. The um, toilets, if you need the toilets, we have, oh, hang on, I'll go forward, assembly. We have nano toilet on the screen, but the good news is we have full-size toilets just across the way here. Um, and so directly outside, if you need to go, that's where you go. There are also toilets around um, campus. It'll be easy to find, they're all signed, um, but the closest ones are directly across the way. Um, in terms of evacuation, uh, this building is uh, very well equipped. It tells you exactly what to do <laughs> um, and there'll be people with yellow hats as well. So there'll be, a, there's a speaker with a voiceover if uh, we need to evacuate um, for a drill or for the real thing. Uh, and so um, you, I haven't unmuted. No, I haven't unmuted, that's, yeah, I just had a message. Okay, so everybody, hi everybody online. <laughs> um, Apologies for that. You've got me now. That's brilliant. Um, 
So we'll, uh, hopefully you can read lips really. No, you can't see me. Can they see me? No, I don't know. All right. I'll catch you up later over morning tea, everybody online. Um, this is ironically the part that they won't need to worry about. Uh, <laughs> if you need to, for those of us here, if you need to evacuate, this is where you are. Um, you go out into the, past the cafe here and around to this uh, green lawn. Uh, and if you assemble there, that's a pretty pretty good spot to, to be if there is an emergency and, and people with yellow hats will look after us. <laughs> okay. Uh, come on. And now I'm frozen. Oh, toilets. Okay, go back. Um, COVID safe. You might have heard today in the news that the restrictions are becoming less and less. Um, but just keep in mind that uh, we need to look after each other. Um, social distancing. If you're sick, please stay at home, uh, and uh, and just um, you know be be aware of um, the COVID. Uh, the need to, to keep us all healthy. Um, so I'm flicking around all over my slides here. Um, I won't come into this now. What I'd like to do is just mention that uh, um, we have some amazing uh, support from sponsorship, uh, and so. If you grab your, has everybody got their, some of you are going on your laptops and things, I think. If you look at the last few pages, you will see there that we've got um, quite a bit of sponsorship which supports the school. Um, I won't go through all, all the list there, but please take a look and uh, get to know the people from those companies who are here with us uh, today. Um, they are wonderful supporters of the Winter School and of ANFF, and uh, you might um, realise that this being a, uh, uh, a winter school and you're coming for free, this is how we do it. That uh, they are really keen to give back this knowledge to you and support um, your learning. So please um, participate, talk to them, see what they've got on show out there and, uh, and enjoy their company this week. So um, just one or two other things. Uh, there are industry tours today. Um, there will be two sheets like this uh, hanging around outside and Bell's asked me to remind you that you need to register for the tours if you'd like to go. So please add your name to these, um, these lists. You get to choose one tour. We don't have enough spots for everybody to go on it, but all, both the tours. Uh, so choose the Tindo or the Arapia and Coden um, tour. Uh, and Bell mentioned that if you're a local and this fills up, uh, we'll be able to um, accommodate uh, some and like another tour if we need to another time. But during the school, that's prioritised people who have come from far. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, there is an OptoFab dinner and tour 6 to 8 p.m. Um, Wednesday. Wednesday is tomorrow, right? <laughs> Wednesday night uh, at, uh, at the city. So please have a look. It's on the bottom of your presentation. Uh, that'll be a fantastic uh, tour. It's a sister uh, facility to ANFF SA. Uh, we're all under the ANFF umbrella uh, and uh, Heike leads the team there and uh, they're looking forward to showing you their facilities as well. Okay, I feel like I've forgotten something. At least we're not muted anymore. Um, so what we'll do is move straight to uh, our opening um, presentation from um, Dr. Jane Fitzpatrick, Patrick, uh, who is the CEO of ANFF. And I mentioned before about the, the community that we are across the country. We're very privileged to have Jane come all the way to South Australia to join us to open uh, the school. Thank you, Jane. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Craig, and I am absolutely delighted to be here today to help open this ANFF SA Winter School uh, in spring. Uh, my job is to hold the umbrella that uh, Craig was talking about. Um, I hold the whole network together and try and keep all these uh, incredible nodes uh, working seamlessly together to provide a whole country wide. Uh, facility that people can come in and do fabrication. And fabrication to a lot of people means a lot of different things. You'll get a taste of it this week. Um, what fabrication ANFFSA is um, experts in. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're going to see Optifab as well, you'll also get to see some of the Optifab um, fabrication technologies that they have there. 
But fabrication is a wide and varied field, and so therefore we need a lot of different expertise um, across the country and a lot of different facilities across the country to provide that kind of um, expertise in all those different areas. So my job is to keep those all together. Um, the ANFF SA Winter School is one of the key ways in which we promote that um, fabrication knowledge and how we share it with, the, with new students and people who are not uh, have never used fabrication before in their projects. And we try and tell you how you can use fabrication to make research better. Um, what we provide is the tools and the expertise to ensure that when you actually do come in and say, I have a problem, I'd like to make this, that what you do is you don't spend two years trying to figure out how to make this. You actually come in, we help you figure out how to make it, we show you how to use the tools, you get what you need quickly, efficiently, and then you go off and use that in your research and you get your results quicker. And that's what we're trying to do. But it's not just about research. We also do this for industry. We also help research and development and commercialization work its way through from the very basics all the way through to new products that are going on market. Um, and you'll both um, AMFSA and I think I've got C. Ben from Optifab here, both provide parts that are going into commercial products, things that are actually being sold on market. Um, so it's really important to note that it's not just about the research excellence that we do here, but it's excellence across the gamut of research, development and commercialisation. And the fact that ANFFSA has so many incredible industry partners is part of the reason why you're going to have such a great experience this week. This week will not just be some theory and some practicals um, in multi-million dollar labs, which you would probably never see unless you came to something like this, but you will also get to see, talk to some of our industry partners who are using fabrication technologies to produce things that are real and you know, out there in the real world. So it's not theory, it's actual practice and it's actual real industry and real jobs. So part of the ANFF remit is training and knowledge and that's why we do this um, and that's why we support AMFSA to do it. And I have to say, I'd like to just say thank you to AMFSA for their leadership in this, including the likes of Belle, who is currently trying to get a good photo of me, but she's got the wrong side, so that's not going to happen. Um, but it's their tireless hard work to put this week together um, and to really give you the best experience you could possibly have from a, a week that you, will never, that you don't have to pay for. And that is really something that we strive to do, and we will support AMFSA to do it in the best, best way possible. So after all of that, um, all I'd like to say is have a great week, use it, talk to all the people that you see standing up here, talk to all the peers that you have, and then t make sure that you take the experience of all of the tours that you're going to get, and really make the most of your week here. And then I hope to see you all in a bunny suit inside a clean room sometime soon doing the, your work on our tools to do what you want to do going forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Jane, um, for opening the school uh, and giving us a bit of a, a taste of um, what to expect. Um, just to sort of reiterate a little bit, what Jane's saying is that uh, Networking in this week is one of the key things that we hope that you'll get out of it. Um, there are people from uh, all over the place uh, there, and from students, undergraduate students, uh, right through to um, professors and industry leaders and um, former chief scientists and all sorts of people. So um, get to know each other um, during the morning tea and make sure you spend time to reach out and just chat to people you haven't met before because I guarantee you that'll be very um, fruitful. So, I just want to check, Jane, you're monitoring, uh, Jane, Belle, you're monitoring the chat? Yeah, good, good, thank you. Okay, so, um, just to jump through. So, I was just saying about some of those experts, this is a, a, a one slide snapshot of a diverse uh, expertise. Um, and so you can, you can see there, uh, Simon Doe, I just want to point out a few people here. Simon Doe, where's Simon? Simon, put up your hand. So 
I'm the director, but Simon's really in charge. <laughs> he, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, he's making sure our facility is running, uh, you know, um, perfectly well. Looks after the team and the facilities. And if you uh, find that you would like to do something with our facilities after this week, you know, you've made a discovery of a capability that you need or want to know more about. Um, Simon's a great contact point to reach out. Uh, and ask how to access the facility. It's an open access facility. Uh, anyone can access it from anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, Simon is a great um, go-to to ask your questions. And you don't have to know exactly what you're, you're doing. <laughs> it's nice to have a, good, a reasonably good idea, but uh, you can come with pretty open questions and learn um, along the way with our team supporting you in your innovations. Um, next there is David Lewis. Um, David is uh, not here at the moment. He might come later in the week. But David is uh, leading up the Flinders side of our, um, our node uh, and is an expert in nano things, nanomaterials and nanoscience. Um, so going through, I won't go through everybody. They're just a couple of key people, key contacts. So if you're trying to reach out at Flinders, uh, Jason as well, actually. Jason uh, Gascook is a good person to contact out at Flinders if you want to access their facilities. But feel free to, to reach out to Simon. The other faces here cover uh, everything from microscopy uh, to nanomachining uh, and moulding uh, and advanced photolithography that you'd use to make some of the parts that might be in your phone. Um, and so uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get a really good experience catching up with all of these people at different times. We should really make it like, um, you know, the yellow brick road. You should have to tick off meeting each of these people. I'll be impressed if anyone can do that with their, their, um, their program and show me that you've met them all. That would be outstanding. So we have many um, volunteers. I mentioned that already. Um, and so just to, just to highlight um, some of the participants in making this school possible, UniSA, Flinders University, University of Adelaide, um, DS, uh, DST group, um, so it's the Defence Science and Technology group, um, including people from here up the road at Edinburgh, um, the University of Tasmania, Arapia Electronics, Fertilis, Kodan, Macquarie University, Tindo Solar, uh, NASA, uh, we'll be speaking shortly, which is fantastic. Um, Medical Device Partnering Program and Karina um, Biotech. These are people who, or these are companies or universities where people have put up their hand to um, volunteer their time. And now to our sponsors who uh, this time I will name and highlight because they're out outstanding friends of the facility, AXT, uh, EVG, um, Olympus, uh, SciTech, NanoVacuum and Leica, and you'll rub shoulders with uh, these outstanding companies this week as well. And thank you to all those companies who have supported us. Some of the people are sitting in the room um, and we're very grateful for that. So make new friends and colleagues. Don't underestimate that. Networking is sometimes underestimated in your learning uh, and at university. Um, make the ch take the chance. I've seen many of these network relationships from winter school lead to research and industry relationships afterwards. Probably should have started with this. This is ANFF uh, um, as a sort of snapshot. We have eight nodes around the country and they all have their own expertise. Ours was built out of microfluidic and lab on a chip devices and has evolved into delivering all sorts of different science and technology as you'll see this week. Um, the, the facility was, that uh, Jane is leading has been established through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. That's a long way of saying a lot of money for a big equipment to, um, in a coordinated way, effectively, um, way back in 2007. But the idea is that we'll be able to establish best practice uh, in research infrastructure in Australia, and I think that has been, has been achieved and, and has been, become sustain, sustainable. This is a little snapshot of our facility, the South Australian node. You can see the different sorts of things, UV lithography, which you'll see, um, and then fluidics, you'll make some devices in the prax, um, right through to um, uh, all sorts of you know, um, other things. There's some fluid, uh, cancer fluidics down there. Oops. Oops, can I go back? Yep. Cancer fluidics and microfluidic devices. Um, there's um, f flexible materials and, and prototyping, um, but it's a, it's a um, very important uh, 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 facility in, in supporting innovation, including in space and defence here in South Australia and medical devices. 
You're at the um, University of South Australia, but I just want to uh, just mention that the Future Industries Institute is linked to this, um, and uh, you will spend some time in the Future Industries Institute um, facilities. And so uh, this wheel is really about the research that goes on. We're industry um, uh, focused, and so we have many links uh, to real world examples, which I hope you'll see during this week. And Flinders as well. This is um, that has two flagship research institutes there, the Institute for Nanosci Nanoscale Science and Technology uh, and the Medical Device Research Institute. And we're very grateful that there's participation from our Flinders um, colleagues um, from both of these, um, these institutes. And they do some amazing things in medical devices and you'll discover that this week through one of the speakers. Again, the, the tour of ANFF, uh, the OptoFab node um, is coming up. Don't forget to, I think we are registering. Is that a registering to go? Yes. My apologies, I actually wasn't listening. Oh, you weren't listening. <laughs> <laughs> that's, very, that's very honest. Um, the uh, OptoFab tour oh, yeah. well, is lunchtime. Lunchtime. Yeah. lunchtime, so write your name down for that to make sure you get a gig. Hopefully everybody else was listening to me. <laughs> um, and just, again, the big picture. This school was all about inspiring your career in this area. Um, knowing what facilities are available and engaging innovators in the best possible way. With the insight presentations you see will be by national leaders and hopefully they will be inspirational. They'll give some context around the lectures that will give you more technical knowledge. Um, there's also the practicals that will give you some hands-on experiences and then the introductory um, content that we'll, we'll pepper throughout the course will be something that hopefully is accessible um, to you at whatever level you're at. So how does it fit together? Well, you've got the program, you are here. Uh, each day there'll be two insight talks and then two lectures. Uh, and then in the afternoons you'll have these practical sessions uh, and there's a tour in between. This page is an important page. Uh, when it comes to the prax, you'll be given a, num a letter, I should say a letter, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, and that will determine which pack you're in. So please pay attention to that when you're given, when you're given the letter, which will be... The list is already there. So if you know your letter, that's great. If you don't, make sure you find out um, before the first practical, otherwise you won't know who to follow. Um, so please check that out in the break. So the lecture jigsaw, as I call it, um, here we have uh, just a quick snapshot of some of the things, it's impossible to put it all on one side, but just an example of how some of the things fit together this, this week. So you see the photolithography over here, I'll try and use my mouse, photolithography um, practical over here can establish some structures. The coding lecture which is coming up will put down some layers in between. Um, and uh, the moulding is lifting off materials and what you can see is you're, you're changing surfaces, coding, or you're structuring and eventually assembling to make a device. And so this is a very simple device here. These are probably just some microfluidic channels or some kind of um, conduits. Uh, um, but you can see that the pathway to go, it could be from design to lithography uh, to um, molding to bonding. And so if you look through the program, we've very deliberately linked together these different uh, aspects of fabrication. And so by the end of the school, hopefully you'll, ha you'll be able to think through some of these pathways. This is just one simple one, but you can create any pathway you want with this, this, uh, this um, uh, combination of uh, capabilities. So this morning, uh, you'll hear a coding lecture. Coding is often the first thing you do. Um, it's not always the first thing you do, but often it is. You put down, uh, say, a sacrificial layer or you're planning to make some electrodes, so you put down some metal films, and Co Colin will give an excellent lecture on that capability. And after that, we'll have um, Mariam, who's going to talk about um, photolithography, which is um, really a, a cornerstone of a lot of the fabrication work we do in the clean room. And so. Uh, that should be a good foundation for you today. Then during the week, we're going to add uh, etching and laser milling and micro machining uh, and then uh, molding, which is linked into the PDMS um, prac. Uh, and finally, packaging over here. So when you start to need to integrate and put things together to make a true device. And so um, I hope that you can see that we've, we've deliberately tried to design this uh, school to fit together if you, with your knowledge by the end of the week. 
and I'll remind you of this uh, each morning as we get started. So today we, we've had Jane already. We'll have Harry join, uh, joining us in just a second. Is Harry early? Is he ready? Okay, excellent. We might be ahead of time. Um, and then Colin and Mariam. So, uh, oh, Henrik. Where's Henrik? Is he in the room? Oh, hi, Henrik. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Henrik, we'd like you to uh, come and share the video and uh, say a few words. Um, so, he Henrik is um, joining us all the way from Austria, believe it or not. And I need to switch. Let's see if I can do this successfully. Okay. Um, where, how do I get back to Zoom? Stop sharing. Oh, is this seeing? Are we seeing this? Um, just want to make sure we're seeing the right thing. Ah, oh, good. So I'll go to full screen. Right. Perfect. So let's just uh, sort of hit it off. Uh, my name is Henrik Ogson. I'm here from uh, App Nano, um, which is based in Vienna, Austria. Let's start playing this. And as we don't have any audio for this video, I flew all the way to Vienna to narrate this for you. You're welcome. Um, so the way to use this machine, which is a 3D printer for nano micro printing, it's very easy. It has two buttons on the front, one to start the machine and one to open the door. You select an objective, put the objective in the machine, put a vat on top of it. You fill the vat with the liquid photoresin and then you can put different substrates in. So this is one of the sort of inserts. In this case, we're looking at a very small substrate. There are far larger, up to six inch wafers can be put into the system. Very modern software um, for data preparation. You select your file, start the job, and after the job is printed, you simply take um, the substrate with your polymer structure out of the machine, put it in isopropanol alcohol that will take the unused monomers and make it uh, into sort of micro droplets that are heavier than the IPA, so they will fall to the bottom of the beaker. We have another machine, it's called the Nano One Bio, which is basically the same thing, but with a built-in incubator. That means if you're printing with living cells in hydrogels, either in well plates or in slide well, as in this case, or for example, inside of a microfluid chip, you mix the hydrogel with the cells in a sterile environment, put everything in your chip, put the chip or slide well inside of the incubator chamber, goes into the 3D printer, and you can print the highest resolution um, microfluidic work that you can find in the world with um, uh, biomaterials and living cells. The machine, as I said, has full control of CO2 levels, just as an incubator should, temperature control, humidity control, and after printing, you take a, your sample out again, remove the unused hydrogels, fill it with PBS or other nutritional fluids, and Bob's your uncle. You're ready to work with uh, vascularization, uh, tumor models, and such. And that's the two and a half minute I came here for. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Look at Wizard Wednesday. Yeah. Join us in our weekly struggle against the evil oh, force wow. of custom. Okay. How do I get rid of that? <laughs> also wishing you a great week, of course. Thank you very much, Henrik. Um, how do I have, to, I have to get back? Let's see. Oh, now I don't know which one it was. We're up to this one. Um, but we're going to go to Harry, right? So I'll stop sharing, I think. We're wrestling with Zoom. Um, <clears throat> let's see if I can... Maybe I'll pin us. Oh, that's a bit weird seeing myself. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Henrik. Oh, he got out before I... Is it? Um, but uh, what you saw there was a brand new uh, tool that we've installed just this year here at uh, ANFFSA. It's the world's fastest uh, two-photon uh, nano 3D printer. 
Uh, and so it's really quite an incredible capability. So make sure you chat to, to Henrik and the team about what that can do um, because it's really world best um, capability. So as I mentioned, we have some um, wonderful speakers and uh, to open uh, the um, insight talks for, for this uh, school, we actually have uh, Dr. Harry Rajpa Rajapal um, from NASA Glen Silicon Carbide Technology. So uh, this is NASA uh, at uh, NASA Glen Institute, which is in Cleveland. And uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have him dialing in. It's a long way to come. Uh, and it's, I think it's quite late at night. So uh, Harry, we greatly appreciate you joining us. So Harry's de developing extreme environment silicon carbide electronics for aerospace systems. He's joined NASA after two in 2019 after completing his PhD in electrical engineering. He has participated in sensor actuator development and sensor integration projects, including piezo electric valve and drag force flow sensors for fuel mod modulation in jet engines. Uh, NEMS mechanical switches to lower standby power reduction for efficient, uh, energy efficient integrated circuits and a surface micro-machined a silicon carbide capacitive acceler accelerometer. I'm sure they put these things in the, here to, uh, to challenge my pronunciation for combustion. You want to unpin that, do you? I just want to have, um, sorry. Okay. Uh, for co combustion applications and personal navigation in GPS denied in environments. And one of the things that we're really excited to hear about is just how um, microengineering is allowing us to adventure into space uh, and what kind of uh, materials and, de and devices and technologies uh, are allowing that to happen. And so we have an expert with us. Um, hi, um, Harry, it's great to see you there connected. Uh, and uh, it looks like you're floating in space with the, that background. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's a delight to have you join us and uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing your presentation uh, today. Um, and I'll make you full screen. Just give me a sec, I'll unpin us. Pin. There we go, I'll full screen. And all correct, so you should be able to screen share. So Harry, over to you, thank you for joining us. Okay, Harry, just check if we got your audio. Can we hear you? Oh, we don't have your audio, Harry. I don't know. Yes, can you hear me? Ah, now we can, excellent. Uh, Thank you. Yes, great. Thank you, I had muted my, uh, my microphone and then I'd forgotten to unmute it, sorry. Uh, well, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm, um, I'm Hari Rajgopal. I'm uh, with the Smart Sensing and Electronics Systems Branch at NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, the title for my talk uh, is Microengineering for Space Exploration and uh, uh, basically focusing on recent work at NASA Glenn. Thank you. So um, uh, before I proceed, I wanted to um, actually uh, what I wanted to that, uh, focus, well, I wanted to, uh, part of my talk is obviously focused on microengineering, uh, but I also wanted to give uh, somewhat of an overview of what we do here at NASA um, and to provide a broader perspective and understanding as to our work. Um, and it's uh, really quite exciting. Actually, this is a great time uh, to, in the space exploration, as you folks all know, um, there are multiple commercial and government entities going into space uh, to do a number of things. And so uh, this is a great time for those of you who are interested to, uh, you know, to uh, find a path, career or path in uh, space exploration. Um, with that said, um, you know, this, is in the, uh, this is a slide of NASA Glenn. Uh, we are located right next to the airport. Uh, we were one of the three original centers that was started back in the 1940s by the US government. And one of the reasons uh, NASA, uh, NASA Glenn was located in Cleveland, Ohio, was to be away from the 
uh, 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 from the uh, from being too close to the continent, um, away from the coast. Uh, with that being said, uh, uh, these uh, this slide basically uh, talks about or you know shows you where all the locations are um, of, of NASA. So we have about eight centers at NASA. Um, and the um, original three uh, NASA centers were NASA Ames, NASA Glenn, and NASA Langley. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is actually a private entity. It's a federally funded research and development center. And of course, you have the other NASA centers uh, like Kennedy, Stennis, Marshall, and Johnson. Um, so the, the, the four... Um, the four NASA centers which focus on space in terms of actual missions are uh, NASA Langley, NASA Goddard, uh, NASA Ames, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, we at NASA Glenn were originally, uh, you know, our focus was aeronautics, and we have slowly pivoted towards uh, space exploration um, as time has progressed. So, uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, uh, mention was how uh, we proceed with our research and our uh, exploration. Um, and so, uh, you know, as technologists, we implement uh, ideas, uh, but basically the, the reason for our implementation comes from the science. And so, um, and so we have, uh, you know, various mission directorates that enable us to do various things. Um, so we have the Science Mission Directorate, which leads the agency in four areas of research, uh, Earth science, heliophysics, heliophysics is related to the sun, uh, planetary science, and astrophysics. Uh, we have the Aeronautics uh, Directorate, uh, which uh, basically focuses on innovation, technologies, and capabilities for the airspace system, airspace system and aircraft. Uh, the current focus is on a hybrid and electric aircraft. Um, the third directorate is space exploration related to human exploration. And so, uh, you know, anything related to the moon and Mars currently is part of the, uh, uh, and the ISS, right? The uh, International Space Station is related to the HEOMD uh, directorate. And finally, we have the Space Technology Mission Directorate, which uh, develops and demonstrates, you know, technologies uh, for our, our missions. And so this is an, um, you know, an overview of just the planetary fee, uh, fleet, um, in just solar system missions alone. Um, we are not talking about uh, Earth-related uh, Earth mission, Earth missions like remote sensing. We are not talking about um, uh, universe-related like the Hubble um, and James Webb telescope. We are just talking about the solar system missions. And if you see this chart, you can see, uh, is, you know, we, uh, we are basically split it into the Moon and Mars missions and the solar system missions. Um, and so uh, with respect to the, uh, the Mars, uh, the blue ones are those currently um, in flight or in orbit. Um, and then the, uh, the, uh, and then the uh, green, green ones have, you know, are currently in operation. Uh, the, the yellow, um, the yellow ones are those that are, or the um, orangish ones are those that are in formulation. Um, and so, uh, if you notice the Mars, uh, with respect to you know the Mars um, and Moon um, path, uh, we have the Insight, we have the Maven, the Curiosity, um, and the Mars Odyssey, and then anything uh, labeled ESA is the European Space Agency. So clearly, we have a lot of Moon and Mars missions that are either, you know, in progress or are going to happen uh, soon. Um, and so, uh, with respect to the solar system, uh, we have, uh, you know, um, many as well. Uh, we have, for example, the Dragonfly is a quadcopter that is being developed for Saturn exploration. Uh, we have Juno and the Europa Clipper for uh, Jupiter, uh, and we have a whole slew of other missions, including for asteroids, um, uh, you know, even, for, you, even, even to explore asteroids. So, 
So with respect to our smart sensing and electronics systems branch, um, our focus is on developing sensors and electronics for uh, diagnostic engine health monitoring, uh, the controls and the safety aspects. And so all these, uh, and, and so when it comes to engine health monitoring, it's essentially for uh, extreme environments. Um, and so we make use of non-silicon-based technologies uh, for that. And so we use a wide band gap semiconductor like silicon carbide uh, for such environments. Uh, we are also, uh, you know, uh, both, for, both for electronics and sensors. So, uh, you know, with respect to the physical sensors, we use uh, both bulk and surface micro machine and thin film uh, to measure, you know, pressure, stress, strain, heat flux, radiation. And we also uh, have um, uh, successfully made uh, chemical gas sensors for leak detection, emission, fire and environmental and human health monitoring. So uh, uh, the research tr thrust in our branch uh, arise from a consequence of that. We have the intelligent propulsion systems that we uh, spent a lot of time on in the past. Um, you know, sensors which operate at uh, higher than 450 degrees centigrade um, for improving engine performance, um, efficiencies and emissions. Um, and on the right side, you see um, uh, what we are currently been focusing on, which is Venus uh, technologies. Um, and so this, the image on the right is basically a concept, a uh, concept drawn by my colleague, John Verbanek. Um, and the, the concept is uh, a LISI, which is a long life in situ solar system explorer. So the concept is basically uh, a lander that lands uh, on the surface of Venus to collect data and then send it back to Earth. And, and what makes, um, and, you know, one of the things that to keep in mind is each of our planets in our solar system is unique. And so we really have to custom design sensors, electronics and systems, including both entry systems, descent systems, and so on, specific to each planet or asteroid or moon. Um, and so, you know, in this case, Venus is very unique in that the atmospheric pressure is 92 times the pressure on Earth. The temperature goes, uh, is pretty steady, uh, but it's very high. It's 460 degrees centigrade. And its chemical composition is, um, is, uh, is pretty toxic in some ways. Uh, lots of carbon dioxide, uh, you know, carbon monoxide, uh, HCl, uh, you know, hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and hydrogen sulfide, uh, and so on. So in short, it's not a very pleasant place to be. And then... So a, a, a natural question arises as to why are we then interested in such a place? Well, one of the things is we would like to explore all, you know, our solar system, uh, but it almost seems like the Venus surface is an extreme of what would happen if there were too much greenhouse gas. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll come to that shortly, but I wanted to tell you, uh, just give you a brief overview of, um, you know, the facilities in our branch. Uh, th this is this is not all encompassing. Just a couple of a uh, few slides on it. Uh, with respect to fa facilities, uh, you know we have fabrication equipment like furnaces uh, on the left, um, you know, and then uh, on the right we have a custom spotter system that we have developed, um, you know, uh, by sourcing uh, you know different parts uh, for a, for a uh, you know conductive. Uh, you know, ceramic almost like tantalum silicide. Um, and so, uh, you know, so we use our, our fab is primarily four inch wafers because silicon carbide wafers, especially are very, very expensive, um, even though they are now, uh, you know, commonly used, especially for power devices. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who are interested in the power technologies, like, you know, high power devices. And we also have characterization equipment by like the scanning electron microscope and an optical profilometer. Uh, these are fairly newer systems that we have, uh, you know, incorporated in the last uh, uh, four, 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 five years. And we also have surface analysis, uh, uh, you know, tools like the OJ um, electron spectroscopy system and also the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy system. Uh, now, the, like something like the OJ is useful for depth profile, uh, you know, understanding the chemical element and thickness composition of, uh, you know, a multi-layer metal stack. Um, 
And so, you know, so it's basically a good synergy between, um, you know, process categorization and surface analysis. So coming back to uh, uh, Lissy and Venus, um, you know, this is a fairly busy slide, but really what the takeaway from this is, uh, you know, what I'd like you to uh, take away from this is, well, you know, we are talking about a habitable zone. And so what do we mean by habitable zone? So if you look at uh, the uh, vertical axis in this uh, uh, chart, and we look at the figure 6,000 Kelvin, that corresponds to our star, uh, the sun. And so if you go across that on the x-axis, you'll see that, you know, there is Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, Venus should be somewhat in the habitable zone, and yet it is not. The question is, how do you define whether planets are to be in a habitable zone or not? Well, um, it, it depends on the radius of the planet's orbit, um, you know, the mass of the body, and uh, the radiative flux of the whole star. So one would think that Venus may just be at the cusp of being habitable, and yet it is not, and we want to know why. Um, and so, now, when you look at this, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, a slide comparing uh, Mars and Venus to Earth. And if you see, uh, uh, you know, Earth, uh, the Venus is about 82% of Earth's mass. The orbit is 72% of the Earth's mass. Um, now, if you compare that to Mars, that's, you know, Venus is much more similar. Uh, however, the temperatures vary significantly, right? I mean, Mars goes between minus 143 to 35 C whereas Venus as well, 460C, um, you know, and based on lander missions, we have years of data from Mars and we continue to explore that as, and we will be uh, continuing to do so. Whereas, you know, almost all our surface data from Venus came from uh, Venera, the, the Russian Venera D exploration, which was just in, uh, you know, uh, a couple of hours or so. So uh, with respect to LISI, which is the solar system explorer for Venus, uh, what are we trying to do? Uh, you know, we are trying to probe to acquire and transmit science measurements from the Venus surface. So this is a lander mission, uh, not an orbiting mission. So we want to be able to survive uh, 460 degrees centigrade um, for more than a couple of hours or so. Um, so the key attributes is, you know, we would leverage our high temperature electronics initially developed for aircraft engine instrumentation a capture and transmit the data in real time. Uh, we won't be storing it, but it will be in real time. Uh, we capture and send, right, uh, you know, periodically. And then we power this all with a battery. And yes, we are actually developing a battery which can operate at 460 degrees centigrade. Um, and we have demonstrated that. Uh, that is not by uh, our, um, you know, our branch, but one of our branches, uh, one of our other branches uh, at uh, NASA Glenn. So what is the science? That is really the motivating factor here. It's not the technology, it's the, uh, it's the science. Um, and so uh, we want to estimate the moment exchange between the planet and the atmosphere. Uh, we want to study the surface level atmospheric chemistry variation. We want to acquire temporal data to update the global circulation models. And Venus is, uh, you know, if you, uh, you want to, you know, understand uh, you know, do some research on your own further, you'll see that the Venus atmosphere is very complex. Um, and then we want to basically have a, you know, demonstrate that this is a, a, like, you know, we are capable of doing something like this. It's a technology demonstration for more capable future lander missions. And so the operational goal is to operate for a minimum of one Venus, uh, you know, daylight period and a day-night transition, which is about 60 Earth days and then take and, take and transmit measurements periodically, you know, based on science need or to maximize, uh, trans, maximize data transfer, you know, to the orbiter. So that being said, what are the measurements we would like to do? Uh, we would, we want to measure the wind speed, or we want to measure orientation, or we want to measure the surface temperature and pressure, and we, we want to measure the near-surface atmospheric chemical composition. 
and we, all, we also want to measure the incident radiance. So this slide basically kind of is a, um, you know, I guess a synopsis of perhaps what uh, the, the transition between, say, a university and, uh, you know, what we do here at NASA. And so this is what is known as, this chart is a, 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 a TRL chart, technology readiness level. So if you look at it, uh, you start that the TRL one is something that is basic principles observed and reported. Um, and then it goes all the way up to TRL-9, which is an actual system flight proven through successful mission operations. So the question is, do we necessarily use uh, anything? Do we use it only at the TRL-9 level uh, always? Or, um, you know, where do we uh, actually use this for space applications? And so the TRL-9 is typically used for manned missions uh, where, you know, human life is at stake. Uh, if it is a non-human mission, we are very comfortable going to space with a TRL-6 uh, uh, level. And so a TRL-6 is basically a model or prototype demonstration in a relevant environment. So, you know, whether you demonstrate that relevant environment in ground or you have to uh, demonstrate it in space uh, with a, as a trial um, exploration is, you know, uh, obviously we would prefer ground for cost reasons. And that, um, and that really transitions over to the next slide, where we actually have developed uh, here at NASA Glenn an extreme environment rig, which is an 800 liter test chamber for high fidelity simulation of the Venus atmosphere. The first 10 chemical constituents of the Venus atmosphere, including sulfur, uh, it can operate at 460 C and uh, you know 9.4 millipascals capability and capable of running for months. And so down to real uh, technology uh, demonstration. So uh, here is the electronics that we have developed and demonstrated. So these are, on it, these, so since it is, a, we are using wide band gap semiconductors, uh, we are using uh, non-CMOS technology. So we are using a junction field effect transistor-based electronics, which actually most of the students today would not even be studying um, because it is, um, you know, it was one of the, uh, along with the, say, the bipolar junction transistor, one of the initial set of uh, transistor topologies, uh, you know, demonstrated. But it is extremely well suited for high temperature technologies. Um, and so, Using the JFET-based electronics, we are enabling a wide range of sensing and control applications at high temperature. Amplification, signal amplification, conditioning, local processing, and wireless transmission of data. And the circuits currently are about thousands of JFETs um, in a chip. Uh, we are actually, uh, we are right now uh, implementing a fab um, process. Uh, actually, as we speak, we hope to finish the fabrication uh, towards the, at the end of this year or early next year with about uh, 10,000 uh, JFETs a chip uh, for more sophisticated electronics. And so if you look at the top is, um, uh, is merely a schematic. Um, it's a two layer interconnect process. Um, and you know, since it's a JFET, it doesn't have a, an oxide layer like CMOS does. Um, and if you look at the uh, pic underneath, it's a scanning electron, uh, it's a cross section scanning electron uh, image. Um, and so, uh, you know, you see some pretty, uh, you know, uh, exotic materials like tantalum silicide, um, uh, you know, and then you, you, you a pretty complex dielectric, you know, a, a stack like, you know, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, and once again, silicon dioxide. So these are the various steps that enable us to withstand or make something durable at the Venus uh, environments. And so, you know, what is to be kept in mind is this is really a multi-engineering, a multi-science approach, right, to enable such a technology. So people in material science, people in mechanical engineering, electronics, device physics, and all, all come together. And of course, uh, electronics design all come together to actually, you know, create uh, such, uh, you know, a device for a mission. 
And so these are the res results. Um, on the left, uh, you'll see a very simple NOT gate, but what is pretty amazing uh, to me itself, because this predated my joining NASA uh, uh, from our group, is uh, you know our group has demonstrated um, electronics over a 1,000 degrees centigrade temperature span from minus 190 to 812 degrees C. Um, so what is the relevance of the one mi minus 190? That is how cold the moon gets when it is the coldest region of the moon gets to about minus 190 C. So it's important that you know we are trying to demonstrate that this is not just useful for Venus; it could be also used uh, for the moon. Now the question is, does it matter? Uh, you know, there might you know silicon may or you know there might be other technologies. Well, what we are trying to demonstrate is we don't need uh, you know we can eliminate some degree of packaging by having electronics completely exposed because then it saves weight and you can add other things for the mission. So this is really about you know, the consequences of reducing weight savings and so on, enabling other uh, things. On the right, you see you know, a demonstration of a RAM chip that has operated successfully for more than a year at higher than 450 degrees centigrade. Um, so, you know, so we have really demonstrated our technology in terms of durable, durability. Uh, the question is now we are trying to make it more uh, sophisticated, and we are also actually in the process of transitioning our technology to, um, you know, uh, tech transferring the technology um, outside. And so, um, you know, and this is just a slide to showcase that uh, testing matters. So on the top left, you see an electronics chip, which is before packaging that we have made. Uh, you know, before packaging. On the right, top right, we see a chip which is tested in in the in the chamber after 60 days. And what you can see is on the you know on the edges of the image, you can see that the bond pads have are discolored. Um, you know, so uh, you know that basically tells you how harsh the environment is. It's you know the the device is operational, but you can see that you know there are reactions which are slowly occurring. On the on the bottom. You can see what happens, uh, you know, if we don't choose the right materials. So one of my colleagues had bought a waveguide uh, from a company. She had spec'd it out correctly, but then the company sent her a waveguide with the wrong material. Uh, and so what happens is after putting that in the chamber, you know, the material reacted and grew crystals, um, you know, and that just doesn't uh, make it very functional uh, and is less than optimal. And so we have actually published a paper which says, you know, well, we are we we learn by doing. We have, you know, uh, exposed various materials to the Venus surface ambient, and we have, you know, devil, uh, you know, uh, I guess published a list of materials that works and does not work. So obviously, silicon carbide is virtually inert to almost anything. You can only melt silicon carbide uh, with uh, potassium hydroxide at 550 C. So uh, highly uh, basic. Molten KOH is the only thing that will destroy silicon carbide or melt. Um, and so we have, you know, and surprisingly, three or four stainless steel is perfectly fine for the Venus uh, environment. Uh, alumina or sapphire is also perfectly fine, no reaction. Uh, so that was the electronics, and I want to transition to uh, sensors now. These are all simple uh, in concept. The question is, uh, we basically, you know, to keep in mind is something we designed for robustness and durability, um, and, and that's where, uh, you know, our focus is. And so the wind sensor is a typical drag force uh, cantilever beam uh, uh, sensor. You know, you know, if you see on the image uh, on the left, there's, you know, as the wind flows, there's a drag force uh, created, and it uh, bends the beam, and then you uh, read it out from the strain uh, change in voltage uh, due to a strain gauge. And then in this case, we have a full bridge uh, strain gauge um, that, uh, uh, that is actually packaged and ready to insert into the gear chamber. Now, this is a, a gear feed through that is like the uh, test uh, set up as to, uh, to insert it into the gear chamber. Uh, we have the wind sensor mounted at the end of the probe. Um, you know, co-located with the silicon carbide amplifier inside the tube. Uh, you know, there's a three or four stainless steel tube. There's a pressure boundary seal uh, to the gear chamber. 
um, and then the on the left is the exterior wire uh, interface, uh, you know, uh, regions uh, of the uh, of the feed through. Um, all this is is about maybe uh, about a yard, three feet long, perhaps um, approximately. And so uh, here we have the image of an image of a wind sensor inside the chamber uh, on the left, and an image of um, you know the exterior electrical interconnect on the right uh, connected to the gear chamber. And and these are the wind sensor results. Um, so, you know the arrow um, in the uh, the plot actually shows. Um, you know, when a gas boost has been, uh, you know, when we have put in a gas boost and uh, you can see the change in the voltage from the wind sensor um, and also the, you know, the, the fluttering of the wind sensor uh, after that uh, as, you know, um, um, as, it, as, the, uh, as it dies down. Um, and so um, if we go to the next slide, I can show you, uh, you know, the the actual results. So the input resistance at 20 C is about 65 ohms. The input uh, resistance at mean surface condition is about 154. Um, the power consumption of the sensor itself, XVM FI, is about 6.5 milliwatts. Uh, maximum strain about four microns per meter. Um, and then the estimated wind gust at mean surface condition is about 0.5 meters a second. So we were targeting between say 0.25 to 2.5 meters a second. Uh, so the initial results are very promising. And that's all I have. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'd like to acknowledge all my colleagues, both uh, both who have recently retired and uh, currently uh, in the branch. Uh, I, I I realized I'd omitted a couple of uh, names here, uh, but um, you know, thanks to all the staff and uh, uh, you know the support staff um, in of our of our branch. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, Harry. You. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, there's an opportunity for um, questions. Uh, you can ask Harry anything you like. Yes. I'll, I'll relay the uh, question to him if you like. Oh, I'm on mute again. Thank you very much. Where's Bell gone? <laughs> sorry, sorry, Harry, you were on mute a moment ago. Everybody cheered and applauded uh, extremely loudly for you. So um, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Um, was that the question that I was on mute? Or was <laughs> no. Yeah, of course. Come up. Okay. We have a question. They're coming to the microphone for you, Harry. Sure. Um, I'm happy to take uh, any question about uh, anything, even general, um, regarding NASA or the, any other missions. Yeah. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I did not have to um, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Harry. Uh, it's been particularly helpful for me um, and motivating. Uh, I'm a physical chemist working on space technologies as well. I uh, actually just founded my startup last year. Uh, our focus is on lightweight, uh, non-silicon-based photovoltaic systems with flexible design uh, that can be perfect for space exploration. Our aim is also to decrease the cost of deployable space structures like solar panels, antennas, uh, other devices, uh, like electronic dev devices. Uh, that was the background. So my question is, how did you establish this carrier advance but to NASA and to get this huge support uh, as a scientist, as a researcher? Um, and what do you advise? What are your advice to Australian researchers and startups, uh, the industry people, uh, to get this kind of support from NASA or other establishments? Because um, when I looked at other resources uh, to actually prototype the technology and to get some uh, facilities to test the materials, it was very hard um, to get that support. How can we? establish that connection and get that support. Like, how can I uh, send my prototypes for extreme environment tests, for example? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, so, so I think 
uh, one thing to take advantage of is you folks are in Australia, and uh, you know, and I'm not sure how many of you know this, but uh, there's what's known as the five eyes, right? So the English-speaking countries like Australia, New Zealand, England, Canada, and uh, the U.S. Uh, are fairly closely, uh, you know, interact. And actually, it's r really, uh, I don't believe it would be that hard uh, for uh, you folks to interact with us. Um, and so uh, one of the, and, you know, as the, we cannot, we at NASA cannot be uh, experts at everything. And so we actually rely uh, where we can on external partners uh, to develop technologies for missions, right? And so, uh, you know, so, so the way I, I would suggest you, in your case specifically and in, in general as well, is to reach out to uh, uh, folks that you know are even, uh, you know, or even cold call, um, you know, uh, places or uh, people, you know, you, there are a lot of uh, publications that we at NASA, uh, you know, we do have a lot of publications. So while you're doing a literature search and, you know, uh, understanding the technologies and all, you will come across names. My recommendation is to reach out uh, through contacts directly to the people at NASA. And uh, what makes, one of the things that makes us unique at NASA is not that we have all the answers, but we do have a lot of the test facilities which are extremely expensive that almost no one can or has uh, has the resources to, you know, establish. So we have wind tunnels, we have, you know, like the, this gear chamber and so on. So, you know, I strongly encourage, and, you know, my, I didn't mention this, but for example, the electronics, the silicon carbide electronics, we actually have it on our website. So if you do a web search on GRC and NASA, we are the first hit, I do believe, depending on the search engine you use. Um, so if you go there, we actually are willing to fabricate your designs along with ours and provide them to you once we finish the fab. And so you just have to create, an, I think, an agreement. Um, and it becomes especially easy because uh, you folks are in Australia. Uh, and, yeah, you know, uh, so I think that's, that's, it's as simple as that in many respects. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Harry. And yeah, a great question. Uh, and also wonderful to hear that, uh, you know, NASA's kind of open to that engagement. So hopefully we can um, connect you up are there other questions for Harry? Yes, Colin. You come to the mic as well. Uh, yeah. Um, you could, yeah. Uh, Dr. Harry, can you hear me? No, maybe not. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the silicon carbide electronics—they'd be very radiation hard as well, wouldn't they? So they'd be very good for long-term space flight in a challenging EM and radiation environment? Excellent question. Uh, actually, yes. Um, as a wide band gap, particularly, it also depends on the um, on the transistor topology as well, right? And the JFETs combined with the wide band gap semiconductor that we're using actually makes it per, uh, very good. I will not say that that is the best. It depends really on the uh, application so I think where we are unique is we we excel in extre coupled extreme environments. So where there is, say, hot and cold, um, uh, you know, very hot and very cold, or uh, radiation and heat and so on, there we have no competition, uh, silicon carbide and JFET technology. Um, if you're looking at, say, nominal temperatures and radiation, there may be competing technologies that may be slightly more cost effective. Um, so I think uh, the answer is a little nuanced. So, but yes, we are, we have done radiation tests. The digital circuits have been, uh, you know, have had excellent results. Um, you know, there's been no, uh, you know, the results were, uh, you know, the devices operated uh, with no uh, issue uh, errors. And so, yeah, I think uh, that's a good question, and I think the answer is uh, depends, but definitely we are one of the leading technologies. Excellent. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Harry, for your answer. Are there more questions for Harry? 
Harry, could you just flick to your, can you share again and just flick to your slide where you showed the cross section of your device with the multi layers, uh, layers of um, sure. silica. I just want to highlight that for, for the context of the, um, the practicals. So the next um, speaker after morning tea will be Colin who just asked a question. Uh, so Colin's going to talk about depositing thin films and what you see in, uh, in Harry's presentation, in, in, which he's just jumping to in a second, was a cross-section of essentially some thin films on that, on that surface. Um, and after that, we have Mariam, who's going to talk to us about uh, photolithography and how you pattern those films. This is exactly right. Thanks, um, Harry, for that. You see on the bottom right-hand side, there's this, uh, you know, uh, nano, it's nano, isn't it? Micro, yeah. <laughs> micro nano um, layer there where these uh, thin films that have been deposited and they have some specific structure and they've been patterned over the surface to create the uh, electronics and so the next two presentations essentially are telling you how you can get to a device um, like that what kind of steps you need to to make along the way and of course there are many different ways to do that but the next two presentations will be very useful so I just wanted to highlight that some of you might not be familiar with photolithography you might have never done a thin film deposition uh, and you might have looked at that and wondered how you get that and what it is um, that's basically a dice, a slice through uh, a multi-layer um, electronics device. And, and uh, Colin and Marion will open your world in the next two lectures. So after morning tea, come back and enjoy that. Um, I'll give one last chance to any questions. Anyone want to ask Harry for a job or, uh, you know, postdoc? Yes, there's one hand up there already. So Harry, you'll get some job applications at the end. Anyone want to ask another question? We've just got a minute to go before we... No? All right, then, uh, please, as loud as you can, please thank uh, Harry. Again. Thank you. Th thanks again, Harry. Um, for everybody in the room, don't forget, you'll be able to sign up for tours, one tour per person. Uh, you've got to make your choice. Uh, and uh, also, um, there'll be the uh, registration for the um, OptoFab uh, tour um, as well. And so uh, don't forget, mingle, talk to people you haven't met before and enjoy your morning tea. We'll see you back here. I should go do it by the arch, shouldn't I? Wouldn't like to miss anything. Okay, welcome back from morning tea. It was great to see so many uh, people chatting to the uh, industry uh, and each other and our team. So um, we're off to a very, a flying start, as they say. Um, I'm delighted to introduce to you a long-standing friend and colleague of uh, the facility and myself, uh, which is Colin, uh, Pro Associate Professor Colin Hall. Now, Colin is an absolute expert in thin film deposition. Uh, he, um, I've gone off script already, but he is an award-winning uh, thin film uh, deposition expert, and so. Um, and has been delivering um, an outstanding presentation to this uh, winter school for um, many years. And so, Colin, we're very grateful for uh, your contribution to the school and that you can join us again this year. Um, so to the bio, just to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, it, so Colin is an industry associate professor of the Future Industries Institute at the University of South Australia and leads a research team focused on developing robust coding systems for mining, automotive, decorative and energy applications. So that's a clue of the diversity of what you can do with thin film coatings. This work spans fundamental research, developing and operating deposition systems through, the tech, uh, to, through to tech transfer and commercialisation of the group's research. He has been recognised for this work with the Prime Minister's Prize for New Innovators in 2016. Colin has worked in private industry for nine years and academia for 18 years. And Colin, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome you to the school. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Craig. Cheers. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Is the microphone working? Yeah. I don't want to be standing behind the desk. I prefer to be out here. So today's, it's a lecture. So put on your lecture hat, <clears throat> and we're going to learn about thin film coatings, OK? Um, and thanks for Craig for the invitation. And this will be the ninth one of these talks that I've given. And the slides are not the same. And why aren't you working? OK. No? Is this yeah. There we go. 
Okay, so me. As um, Craig says, um, I've had uh, nine years in industry where I worked on anti-reflection coatings for the ophthalmic industry. Um, I also looked at fast rate plasma enhanced chemical vapour deposition process and I did a lot of coating design and implementation both in R&D and in production. Um, for the last 18 years I've been at the University of South Australia building up the coating capability here. Um, going in the full on vacuum coating, so the thin film take, uh, technology, but also looking at thicker, thicker coatings, weld overlays, and they're certainly relevant for mining. Um, most recently, we're getting into space as well, so I was very interested in the previous uh, speaker's um, just uh, topic and everything. Um, UniSA is part of a space trailblazer, um, and we'll have three projects running for the next four years, and we've just released four <laughs> PhD scholarships to go in line with um, that uh, space trailblazer. So if you're an undergraduate looking for a PhD, come and talk to me. We've got uh, PhDs in space engineering coming up. Um, so that's enough of the advertising. Uh, so the pictures up there, that explains the pictures, the anti-reflection coatings. Um, the thin film coatings that we've done here are a lot around mirrors, so mirrors for automotive especially, and then now we're looking at space. Again, uh, space optics, space mirrors as well. But this talk, what are we going to talk about and why? It's all about the thin films, and I think um, we saw that cross-section of the JFET architecture, looking at uh, the thin films, patterning them, creating structures, overcoding, patterning those, creating structures, uh, and you can create just a single uh, pattern on your substrate using a lift-off technique. So this is where the photolithography comes in. Um, coating is just a two-dimensional uh, boring surface until you pat, um, match it with photolithography and unlock uh, a lot of the um, um, possibilities by photolithography. So you can pattern a mask, overcoat the mask, leave an a electrode behind on your device or vice versa. You can put your coating down, you put a patterned mask over the top and then etch away to, re to reveal a pattern as well. So for context, this why am I here so that you understand the photolithography coating and what comes behind it. Uh, where else would you want to deposit uh, thin films? Um, any sort of transparent conductive uh, oxide, so your touch panel on your um, smartphone, the um, uh, screen on your TV are all enabled by putting indium tin oxide down using vacuum coating techniques. To keep your chips fresh in their packet, they're vacuum coated aluminium. So it spans from the very simple right through to the highly complex integrated circuit. So having a career in vacuum coatings is, uh, well, uh, it's keep, it kept me in a job for almost 30 years, so, and it's still going. Um, here, at, uh, well, here at the ANFF, um, there's uh, vacuum deposition techniques, which is what I'll be covering. They also use electroplating of nickel to do similar sort of stuff as well, but I won't be covering that. So, the talk. Um, obviously, it's about vacuum deposition. I'm going to talk mainly about two different styles, physical vapour deposition, PVD and CVD, chemical vapour deposition. Um, I'll also cover the things you need to know to get a good coating, so process control, how to characterise the coating, how to clean and how important that is, and then some of the testing that we do, the very simple one, does it stick? Uh, so that's going to be the sort of um, uh, topics that I'm going to talk about. I've got, I'm going to try and wrap up probably in about 20 minutes, see if I can stick to time, to allow a bit of question and answer at the end, okay? So let's get stuck into the whole point of it, vacuum, why are we using vacuum? Why go to the big expense of creating a metal box and taking all of the gas out. Why? Because we want to control the mean free path. So that's the distance a particle travels before it encounters another particle, okay? At atmosphere, right now in this room, an atom will travel about 65 nanometers before it hits something else. When it hits something else, it'll lose energy and then it'll go bouncing along. 
as we reduce the pressure, we reduce the number of particles in the chamber, the distance in between those particles or the distance they travel before they hit gets longer and longer. So up in outer space, you're talking sort of 50 kilometres before it hits another atom. They're the two extremes. Um, I think the aeroplane at uh, cruising altitude, it's probably around the... Um, what's the... Oh, I can't even think. It's... Um, What's that? Yeah, anyway, I can't do that in my head. Um, so, yeah, around rough, rough vacuum, so one times 10 to the minus 3 tor, we're talking, you know, uh, centimetres. Uh, high vacuum, one times 10 to the minus 6 tor, you're talking metres. And our depositions typically happen around this, like, one times 10 to the minus 3 to one times 10 to the minus 6 in this region. So you're talking distances of centimetres to metres before they um, hit something. So why is... Um, and I guess the vacuum then allows you to um, make sure that a particle will arrive at your substrate with the energy that you want and not lose a lot of energy on the way. You also take out all the gases you don't want, take out the water, you take out the nit nitrogen, arg um, water and nitrogen, they're the main one, and anything else that's... Um, in the chamber, so you can control the atmosphere and you can put back in the gases that you do want, the working gases or um, yeah, anything else that you do want, or, or oxygen. So, um, vacuum to control the environment and to control the energy of the particles as they arrive. So why is the arrival energy of the particles so important? We go back to a little bit of literature Thornton came up with his structure model. And this relates... In this case, it's looking at the temperature of the substrate and the sputter pressure. Both are analogues for the actual energy of the system. As you put more temperature in, you get more energy. As you reduce the pressure, mean pretty free path goes longer, particles arrive with more energy. So we get to go from high pressure low temperature, your coatings can look like this. They're porous, they're um, uh, columnar um, sort of structures in there. Some situations you would want this. Some people deliberately create these coatings to be porous for their application. Say you want to reduce or to control the diffusion through your sample and you can control the porosity, you can control that diffusion. Other sort of processes, this would be terrible. So for an optical coating where you're trying to, you know, filter out a particular wavelength, as soon as you vent this to a atmosphere, you've got water in there, um, your uh, optical performance would change significantly. So this would be a bad thing. So as you turn up the energy, so drop the pressure or increase the substrate temperature, or put in other forms of energy, you can get denser coatings. So you can see the porosity's gone. You've still got this sort of structure in there, and the atoms are still coming in, landing, and sort of landing and sticking where they are, sticking on each other, and they build a columnar structure. But it's a lot denser. You don't see those large voids or large pores. Um, and for certain situations, this is fine. Uh, probably an amorphous coating as well um, and, you know, quite adequate for a lot of applications. Turning up the temperature a lot or reducing the pressure a lot, you create fully dense, crystallised um, coatings um, that, you know, can represent really high-quality coatings. So you're going from low energy right through to high energy getting different types of coating structures which can be tuned to really give you the properties that you want. Um, so, what's the take-home message and why is it important? We put vacuum in there to control the environment and to control the arrival energy of the um, particles, atoms, clusters as they arrive on your substrate. And that will determine your film properties and how it will um, perform say, in a photolithograph ah, photolithographic process as well. So that's why it's important, and that's why we go to so much trouble of putting it into a vacuum chamber. 
I thought it would be good at this point to talk about what does a vacuum coating chamber look like? What are the key components? Um, they're fairly standard. This is will describe any coating system, uh, vacuum coating system in the world sort of thing. So we need a metal box, normally metal. You can get away with some glass plastic, that's fine as well, but metal is probably the easiest way to go. Um, you're going to need some sort of deposition source and that normally needs a power supply. And I'll talk about the different types of deposition sources later, but that's just going to create your stream of atoms that you're going to get to coat your substrate. Normally you'll have your substrate. To create a uniform coating, you'll want to normally have that coating uh, substrate rotating in some form or other. Uh, you'll have a uniformity mask in there to help create a uniform coating as well. Rotation helps you achieve that. Um, you'll need some sort of control. You'll need a pressure gauge, pretty obviously. If you're varying temperature, temperature control, you might have some sort of thickness feedback in there. You might not, depending on the system that you've got. Uh, and then you'll need a pumping system as well. Uh, there isn't, no one's invented a vacuum pump yet that will go from atmosphere all the way down to high vacuum. Um, so we're always going to have two different types of pumps. One's a high vacuum pump that's used to get to high vacuum, so into the tens to the minus sixes, tens to the minus nines, your very low pressures but you'll always need a roughing pump or a backing pump to help either start the process to get from atmosphere down to a pressure where the high vacuum pump can operate or in some cases it will also operate to help the vacuum, high vacuum pump as well. Uh, on a fully automated control system, you walk up to the chamber and you hit start and the control system takes care of all of this uh, pumping schematic, so you don't need to worry about it. But it's good to know what's going on underneath the covers of one of our coating machines. You'll rough the chamber out, it'll get down to a pressure that normally takes five to ten minutes, then it will switch over to the high vacuum pump and then you'll wait probably another half an hour, maybe an hour, depending on how big your chamber is and how low you want to go, um, down to your base pressure, so that's the starting pressure. That's another important a parameter that controls your film quality as well. Uh, you always want to start at the same pressure every single time because it means you're starting with the same starting conditions. And if you want the same result, you should always start with the same conditions. So base pressure is important and normally reading that off of a pressure gauge is the best thing to go for. And then once it's down to pressure, you can go and start your process. But for you, before you get to that, we need to talk about what sort of vacuum coating you want to do. What makes sense? What's the material you want to do? Um, what's the size of your substrate? How thick are you doing it? All of these questions will help you select which coating technique you're going to use, sort of thing. So not all vacuum coating techniques can do everything, and some are better than others. The two that are most common for us here is physical vapour deposition, and the two is either sputtering or thermal evaporation. So they're the two different physical vapour deposition techniques. Now, I apologise. Oh, no, I can go closer. Can I? Yes, I can. Excellent. So sputter. Um, that's the one that we've got the most here. We've got both types, uh, thermal and sputtering, but we've got, well, ANFF has one vacuum sputter chamber and we're just to get about to get a new one. I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Uh, and then uh, our coatings group has um, three others uh, sputter systems. So these ones are typically a bit smaller. Um, it uses a, a, a um, magnet pack to help confine a plasma in front of your target and then either a DC or an RF uh, applied power supply to create that plasma. Um, what's good about it? Um, it's fairly high energy, so because you're using a electrical discharge to create a plasma, you're accelerating your atoms with that uh, potential, so they have 
a fairly high arrival energy, which means that you can get dense coatings out of it. Um, pretty much, you can sputter almost anything. Um, any sort of metal, dielectric, ceramic, uh, plastic even, you can sputter it if you really want to. Um, the end result, we'll see what we get, but we can try. Um, yeah, Obviously high, it's a physical vapour deposition process. So you've got argon is your working gas, so you'll put argon into your chamber, it gets ionised, that ionised argon gets accelerated to your target, the argon is big and bulky, coming in with a fair bit of velocity, it bounces and hits your target, and then your target sprays it off. All of the atoms of that target get sprayed off and coat everything. So it is line of sight, um, but you're not actually melting the target, you're physically knocking the target material off. So if you've got a high temperature material like tungsten, um, then you can sputter it, whereas trying to thermally evaporate tungsten can be quite hard, because you have to get it up to the melting point of tungsten. So DC, like I said, depending on what you want to coat, what the material you want to do, uh, it will um, match different sort of um, evapor um, deposition techniques. Um, you can do nanometers up to microns, and it's fairly high deposition rate. Um, yeah, RF, radio frequency is more for insulating materials. Um, okay. Thermal evaporation, it's um, literally you're melting the, you're boiling the material. Think about boiling a kettle, that's what you're doing instead of it being water, it's whatever material you've put into your boat uh, and you're just getting it up to its vapour pressure and then it just sprays out everywhere. So it's typically a bit lower energy, so you end up with lower density coat. Um, again, it's line of sight. Good thing about uh, thermal evaporation is you don't need a lot of material to play around with. So if you're doing new coatings, new materials, it's a good way to do that sort of thing. How you melt the sample, you can just stick it up, uh, stick, hook it up, put it into a, a thermal boat, send a lot of current through it and get it very hot that way, a resistive boat, or you can create an electron beam and then um, uh, use magnetic fields to control that electron beam and then heat it up with an electron beam. To help improve the density of the coating, you can also uh, put in an extra sort of power source or an energy source, and that's an iron gun, and then create iron-assisted deposition. Um, and then if you can collect... So what we've got at the university, we've got an electron beam with IAD, and it starts getting close to the similar sort of arrival energy or density of coatings that we get out of the sputter coater. Uh, our electron beam evaporator has a sample, well, we coat an area about that sort of size, so what is it, about 700 millimetre diameter, um, and we can coat fairly large pieces in that all at once, so it's good for large area. So your chip, your chip packets, your aluminium coating on your chip packets are thermally evaporated at metres per second as a roll of plastic goes underneath it. And you can think how much, how many um, chip packets are made each year, high volume nature of it. Um, you know, these processes can be scaled up. That's what I'm trying to say. OK. Uh, another refinement and um, available in other nodes within ANFF is chemical vapour deposition. Um, so I did mention plasma enhanced chemical vapour deposition is one um, uh, variant of it. Another one is atomic layer deposition. So what's very good about atomic... Uh, sorry, I'll go to plasma enhanced. Um, here you're typically using more organic liquid precursors to create a coating. Um, it's widely used in the semiconductor industry for doing silicon dioxide, uh, but can be used to create um, organic uh, polymers as well. So you can polymerize uh, monomers using, polymerize, using um, a chemical vapor deposition sort of thing. Um, can get a high deposition rate. Um, for some systems, you can only coat one side of the wafer. Other systems, you can coat both sides three-dimensionally. Um, 
what's uh, a further refinement of this is atomic layer deposition. And this one's really good. It's super slow, but what's really good about atomic layer deposition is literally you put down one atom layer at a time. And you can see this SEM image here um, is uh, channels uh, in some sort of um, uh, pattern substrate. The coating has been put down on the, on the, on the surface but then it goes down into the well, across the bottom, and then back up again, and it's uniform all the way. So if you've got a very complex structure using atomic layer deposition, you can uniformly coat that structure. So that's where its um, benefit is. Um, very, yeah. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's slow. You've got limited um, sort of precursors that you can um, coat with, but, um, you know, um, multi-layers... Um, what have I said, aluminium oxide, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide are all possible. Um, and, you know, for doing uniform coatings, there's no better way, but very slow. So, um, we've got sputter, we've got thermal, we've got PECVD, and we've got uh, ALD. How do they stack up? So we can see a nice sort of graph here. You're talking step coverage and then deposition rate. So, like I said, not all coating techniques... Uh, do everything, so you can select. If you want 100% coverage, then your only choice is atomic layer deposition. If you want to go fast and don't really care about um, how uniform your coating is over complex structures, then your sputtering or your um, uh, uh, thermal evaporation fits in here, and then you've got these two CVDs kind of in between sort of thing. And they're the sort of typical deposition rates we're talking about. So you're in the 0.1 to 1 micron a minute sort of regions. Um, yeah, okay. So, process control. You've got your coating. How do you get the same thing each time? Like I said, pressure is very important. I think we've covered that off. Your starting pressure and your deposition pressure. Um, what, how much gas you're putting in. You need to get that the same each time. The temperature of your substrate, again, I think we've covered off why that's so th important. Everyone wants to control the thickness. Whenever anyone comes to me, Colin, I want to do 50 nanometres of aluminium. So we need to be able to measure the thickness in some way or form, either in, in situ or ex situ, and hopefully your process is um, reliable enough to get the same thickness each time. Um, you can look, if you've got a plasma, then you can look at that plasma and to see what um, excited species are in that plasma, and that's the optical emission. So optical emission spectroscopy is interesting. Or you can even do mass spectrometry, so knowing exactly what's in the residual vacuum uh, in the form of what's left behind once you've pumped it down, how much water is in there, is there any oil from the vacuum pump or something like that, or, you know, how much argon, how much oxygen have I got in my process. Um, whoever's used the chamber before, what's happened to it is important as well. Uh, and then leak rate. So all chambers leak. Um, what's acceptable uh, is um, something that you need to establish and then make sure that you're below that leak rate. Characterization. So how do we characterise these coatings? Obviously, we're very interested in thickness, so we can do ellipsometry, we can do reflectometry, and we can do physical profilometry. All of these techniques are available here at the ANFF. We can model the coating. If it's, yeah, if it's a dielectric, if it's a multi-layer, we can model it. We can predict if a multi-layer, uh, the optical performance of a multi-layer deposit it and then um, finalise and achieve a particular optical filter design. So we can do that as well. Obviously the physical properties are very important and uh, here at the ANFF we can do all of these chemical, the mechanical properties. Stress is very important in thin films. If you're you know, putting coatings onto a plastic, if the coating's too stressed, it's going to crack and craze. So minimising or controlling or just even measuring stress is important. Uh, if you're doing electrical components, electrical layers, then obviously the electrical 
properties of your coding is important. Um, and understanding how your deposition conditions affect all of these properties is part of developing uh, thin film coatings. Okay, cleaning. Super important. Um, before you even get to do a coating, you're going to need to clean your substrate and it can be integral in getting your coating to stick to your substrate. There's so many different options, it really comes down to your particular case um, and that's where talking with people that have worked with vacuum coatings for a long time can help you hone in on the right sort of cleaning technique. Um, obviously detergent, solvent or chemical cleaning, you might need to do a wet cleaning before you start and then once you've got it into your chamber, normally you've got the ability to do some sort of plasma cleaning as well. So you could uh, do a rough clean first uh, wet, using wet chemical techniques and then move it into your vacuum chamber and then do a plasma clean, use surface activate, get rid of any advantageous carbon, uh, have a very, um, yeah, let's see, receptive surface for your coating. What happens if you don't clean it and why does Simon make you gown up in little um, suits every time? It's to stop this sort of stuff. Because you can imagine a two micron dust particle landing onto your photolithographic pattern and then you coat over it, it's going to act like a mask and you end up with a hole in your coating and that might be exactly where you don't want it and suddenly your electric circuit doesn't work, your porous membrane has a massive hole in it, um, voila, your device is dead. So um, both cleaning the, your substrate beforehand and then keeping it clean is super important. If you get a particle depositing while you're de depositing your stack, then you're going to have a massive defect as well. So um, really, uh, yeah, coating, coatings, the photolithographic technique and coatings are the main reason why uh, Simon makes you gown up and why Simon has to spend so much money in maintaining his facility. Um, so, uh, I'll finish up on adhesion and this is probably an example of how complex some just a simple sort of thing can do. Obviously, everyone wants to have their coating stick in the right place and time, so we need to measure it. We use a tape, tape test, literally, we put a bit of sticky tape over our coating and then we rip it off. If the coating stays behind, that's a good start sort of thing. We can get more elaborate, we can do a pull off test or we can do a scratch test. But first pass, a bit of uh, sticky tape on your coating is a good start. Um, if you don't have good coating adhesion, then you can get into your cleaning regime. Just an example of what you have to go through to get a good gold coating on a microscope slide. You think, oh, gold, that's easy, low melting point material, just evaporate it on there, it won't stick. <laughs> so to get gold to stick, you need to have, start with your glass substrate, you need to clean it, you'll need to do an oxygen plasma activation, then you'll need to put a very thin chrome layer down, probably one to five nanometers of chrome, then you can put your gold on top. So this has come about by trial and error and a lot of smart people before me working this out and now there's a recipe, we follow that and it works. If you've got your metal on your substrate, you will probably have to come up with your own sort of recipe to get it to stick. Um, I, uh, that's my timer. And just to finish off, how good is that? Sorry, I made you jump. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, summing up. Um, there's a lot of different coating techniques out there. Physical vapour deposition is the main one that we have access to. Um, sputtering is the one that you'll... Um, do you actually do sputtering? Yes, in the plants. Good. Um, within the, coat, the materials engineering group here, we've got access to all of those and more. Uh, we do this on a daily basis. So if you need help, if you want advice, come and see me. I'm always more than happy to have a chat. Um, I guess the last piece, um, thanks to ANFF, we're taking, um, uh, we're just about to install a new coating chamber. Um, it's going to be uh, hooked up to a glove box, so we'll be able to do 
um, sample preparation in an oxygen and water-free environment, coat it, bring it out, do more sort of operations and then put it back in, coat it again. Uh, and that'll be a, a step change in performance or opera, um, uh, options for uh, new sort of experiments. So that should be going in about four weeks' time. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Cool. That's it from me. I've finished even early, three minutes early. <laughs> so I'm happy to take any questions. Questions, if there is any out there. Stunned silence. So either he's explained it perfectly. Or I've done a shit job. <laughs> I will go with the former. Um, and yes, our new spotter chamber is going to be a jangle of eloquent, but a thing of beauty. <laughs> and will, it's, as Connor's explained, it is all about the preparation. The coating is almost the incidental part of it at the end. It is all about the prep before it. Garbage in, garbage out. The new chamber will have in situ ellipsometry as well, so that will look at the growing coating optically and we'll be able to tell the optical properties, refractive index, thickness in real time. Uh, we'll be using it to develop fairly complex uh, thin film filters. Um, we're doing a lot of work with CSIRO for their AquaWatch satellite, um, creating filters to be able to sense what, to type, what, what type of green the water is, so then the scientists can work out what sort of algae is sitting in different waterways as the site satellite passes over. So that's some of the stuff we'll be doing with it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Colin. No worries. Okay. Wow. Well, you've gone the healthy option this time, oh. and they are for sharing. Oh. Next up, it actually gives me um, really good pleasure so, to introduce. I'm hide here. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Bad Marion. Let's introduce Marion Paxar, Dr. Marion Paxar. The bit that gives me great pleasure is that Marion actually used to work with us uh, here at AMSSA. Do you want me to start? Then she oh, returned to the dark side and joined our colleagues at the SC. <laughs> uh, yes, fortunately, we're only just up the road and we're still around. And because of the relationship we have, Marion keeps coming back and she works here occasionally. She's here to support us in this. So, Marion, Marion's going to talk to you about photoendotography. Um, <coughs> so, remember the process steps, how it all works together. Uh, not sure, but yeah. Talk about the steps deposition, the photo, how it all works together. So, Marion, are you following around or are you? Probably I'm going to hide here behind the monitor. <laughs> Over to you, Mary. Thank you, Simon. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so, as Simon mentioned, um, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction on a very common microfabrication process, which is photolithography. Um, some of its application has already been um, mentioned in the previous uh, lectures and talks. Um, it's been used to fabricate devices for different applications, electronics, space, biological, photonics, um, and many other applications. It is commonly and widely used in semiconductor industry to, if it works, okay, um, to make ICs and microprocessors and sensors. Um, basically, most of the Devices and smart devices we are using in our uh, daily life has got lithography involved in its manufacturing at some point. And most of these manufacturing processes consist a series of 10 to 20 or even more um, lithography steps. Talking about microprocessors, um, they are actually a very good example of um, showing how this process works. So let's have a look what is inside the microprocessor. So as you can see in this uh, video, it consists of millions of transistors sitting on a piece of silicon, which is actually in the size of a fingernail. If you look close, you can um, see some features and patterns on the surface. But if you use microscopic techniques to look even closer, um, you can tell that these patterns and features are actually etched into the substrate. 
So lithography is the um, technique that is used to transfer these patterns and features onto the substrate. From the scale in the video, we can tell that the feature size is in micro and nano scale, and that represents the uh, feature size that can be achieved in lithography process. Um, it is worth to mention that chip makers are constantly trying to shrink the size of the chips and uh, also achieve smaller feature sizes because it allows them to um, achieve higher performance and longer battery life for the devices. So, <clears throat> so in photolithography, basically, the patterns are imaged onto the surface of the substrate using photomask and UV light. In simple way, if I want to show how it works, um, we've got a wafer. We coat it with a photosensitive chemical, which is photoresist, and then we expose this photoresist to UV light through photomask. Some parts will be exposed to UV light and undergo chemical changes and become soluble. And they can be basically dissolved away in developing solution later. And that leaves us a photoresist pattern on the surface. This photoresist pattern, um, Colin has mentioned um, some of the basically processes that uh, may follow the lithography process. Um, this basically pattern can be used as a mask and we can do things to open areas, to modify the open areas basically. Two main um, subtractive and additive processes are etching and lift off that was mentioned in previous um, lecture. Uh, etching is basically removing the substrate material and it can be done either in wet etching using chemicals such as acids or in plasma etching um, where we bombard the substrate with ions. Uh, there will be some uh, lectures on these two um, technologies and techniques as well later um, in this macroengineering school. Um, so in both of these etching processes, the photoresist um, can withstand the um, etching process and protect the covered area. So after the etching is done, we can strip off the photoresist from the surface and we end up having the etched pattern in the surface. Uh, Lift-off process actually is used mostly to generate patterns like metal patterns and metal electrodes on the surface. The whole pattern wafer uh, is coated uh, with desired metal and then after we wash off the photoresist, we will have the metal pattern on the surface. The pattern photoresist uh, can be also used in um, making masters and molds. Um, a very common application is in PDMS casting where the microstructure from a negative um, master can be transferred to polymer. Um, I think there will be a practical session on this um, process as well. So to better understand how all of these processes work together to basically make a chip, I'm gonna show you a video from Zeiss that shows the flow through the entire chip making. It is starts with silicon wafer, but obviously we um, don't basically, we are not limited to silicon wafer as substrate. Depending on the application, we may use different types of substrate from glass, quartz, ceramic, or any other material. So when we have the substrate ready, we coat it with photoresist. And then this photoresist coated substrate will be exposed to UV light through uh, optics and photomask. As I mentioned, some Parts which were exposed undergo chemical changes and become soluble, and later these parts will be dissolved away in developing solution. And we have the photoresist pattern. We can do things to these open areas like etching, coatings, and um, this is of course just an example. Um, this process is continued and we, we may have several of these uh, modification to our substrate and at the end we basically have this stack of all of these layers on top of each other and a wafer full of identical chips that can go through dicing and packaging and then individual packet chip
can be part of your smartphones or cameras or any other devices. So now that uh, we know how these can be used, let's see what we need for our photolithography process. For the lithography process, we need photoresist and photomask. Photoresist is an organic polymer which becomes soluble or insoluble when exposed to UV light. It has got some photosensitive compound whose properties allows us to basically um, transfer the image. And also it's got um, resin and um, solvent um, to control the viscosity and the deposition properties. Depending on um, how photoresist respond to radiation, uh, there are two main types of photoresist, positive and negative photoresist. Let's see how they behave when they are exposed to um, UV light. With positive photoresist, wherever the resist is exposed to UV light, it becomes soluble and later in developing solution, it will be dissolved away. So from this, we can tell that we get the exact pattern from the mask onto the substrate. But with negative photoresist, actually it works the other way around. Um, wherever the photoresist is exposed to UV light, it becomes polymerized and this cross-link polymerized um, photoresist is less soluble. And then in developing step, these parts, the exposed areas, uh, remain on the surface and the rest will be dissolved away. So with this, we can tell that with negative photoresist, um, we end up having the reverse of the pattern from the uh, photo mask onto the substrate. So um, here you can see a very brief comparison between uh, positive and negative photoresist as it is very critical um, to choose the right type of photoresist to achieve the desired uh, result. Um, usually um, negative photoresist are more resistant um, to chemical attack, attack and they can withstand their like etching, harsh etching environments better comparing to positive ones. But on the other hand, the minimum feature size um, and resolution basically is uh, better uh, with the positive photoresist. Also the sidewall profile we can get from these two photoresists are different. Uh, the positive resist usually give us a, a positive sidewall profile and negative resist gives us negative sidewall profile. It is quite important for some um, processes basically, for example, for lift off process, we prefer to have negative sidewall profile. Of course, uh, this can be um, modified by different factors like thickness of photoresist, type of photoresist, or even the exposure dose. Photomask. Um, photomask is basically a um, square, glass, or quartz with some metal pattern, usually chromium pattern, on one side of it. The um, clear part of the photomask um, define the parts of the photoresist that are being exposed to UV light. Um, in very conventional uh, mass fabrication, uh, lithography is used to basically transfer the patterns and features and design from the CAD file to the surface of photomask. Basically, we've got the glass or quartz uh, um, plates, and then it is coated with chromium. Photoresist goes on top, and then uh, electron beam or precise lasers are used to transfer the design onto the surface of this photoresist. Um, then the unwanted parts will be removed and chromium will be etched off from the open areas. And then when we wash off the photoresist from the surface, we will have a plate with chromium patterns on, the, um, on one side of it. It is quite important when we are making masks, uh, we choose the um, right polarity in our mask design. So here um, you can see a um, standard photolithography process. I don't know why it's just playing music. Um, standard um, photolithography process. Um, depending on that a whole microfabrication process, we may have some complexity in each of these steps. But um, I briefly go through each step and um, explain how they can be performed. The good thing is that later in one of one or two of the practicals, um, you'll be suited up and go to the clean room and then you can see how um, some of these steps are being performed, uh, which is really cool, I think. 
So I think <laughs> Colin um, mentioned the uh, importance of cleaning in um, deposition. It is also very important in the lithography process. So the very first aim in lithography process is to generate a defect-free uniform film that has actually good adhesion to the surface. So to do this, we may need to do some surface prepara preparation. Uh, the first one is cleaning, is just to remove the contaminants from the surface, depending on the type of contamination. We may use different techniques from prana solution, HF acid, solvents, UV cleaning, or any other type of um, cleaning processes. Dehydration. Um, the adhesion of photoresist is can be negatively affected by the moisture content on the surface. That's why in um, some lithography processes, we may need to bake the substrate prior to coating to basically enhance the uh, photoresist adhesion. And then um, still some photoresist basically tend to have poor adhesion to some types of um, substrates. And that's where we use primers uh, prior to uh, photoresist coating. Uh, a very common one is HMDS that makes the surface more hydrophobic and can enhance the <coughs> adhesion. So after we've got the surface ready, then it's time to coat the substrate with photoresist. Um, there are different techniques to do that from spray coating, dip coating, but a very um, common way is pin coating uh, where we can achieve a uniform film in a relatively short time. Um, it is quite simple. If I play this video. The wafer is held by chalk uh, using vacuum. A small quantity of photoresist will be poured in the middle of the wafer and then will be spun around rapidly and then uh, the photoresist will be spread all across the wafer. And we will have a uniform film on the substrate. The thickness of the film is affected by viscosity of the photoresist as well as the spin speed and time of spinning. So usually with conventional um, spinning speed, um, like 3,000, 4,000, um, the final film thickness is completed. And then further thinning is happening during the um, spinning and um, uh, subsequent soft baking process uh, with basically solvent evaporation. So the next step after we coat the substrate with photoresist is soft baking, and this is to remove the solvent residues from the photoresist. This can prevent photoresist sticking to the photomask during the exposure, and also can enhance the, the adhesion of photoresist. Basically during the um, spin coating, the concentration of solvent rapidly sinks initially, and then saturates to a value that depends on the thickness of photoresis, uh, thickness of the film, let's say, and also the solvent type. So usually the concentration of solvent at the end of the spinning is around 10% for thin photoresis and around 35 to 40% for thicker photoresis. Um, and then when we are doing soft baking at higher temperatures, the concentration decreases to 3 to 5 percent, which makes it ready to go through the exposure. So this is where um, all those chemical changes happen within the photoresist. Um, the spectral sensitivity of the photoresist should match the exposure tool we are using. Here at ANFFSA, um, an EVG 6 to any mask aligner is used um, to perform this step. It is equipped with mercury lamp providing emission spectrum between 3 to any nanometer and 460 nanometer, which covers a wide range of um, photoresist. The exposure time depends on the um, exposure dose, of course, the intensity of the lamp, and the thickness and type of the resist. Um, there are three primary exposure modes in mask aligner. Um, in contact mode, the wafer is brought into physical contact to, uh, with photo mask. So it gives us very good resolution, but the fragments can be trapped between the photo mask and wafer, 
and we may have potential damage on the pattern on the photo mask, which can give us um, defects on the photoresist pattern. Proximity mode is quite similar to contact mode, uh, except that a small gap is maintained between the um, photo mask and wafer. Uh, this minimizes the mask damage. Uh, also, it can relatively give us good resolution. In projection um, exposure, uh, an image of the pattern from the mask will be uh, transferred to the substrate. As I mentioned, in microfabrication process, we may um, have a few steps of lithography. So when we are dealing with this multilayer photolithography, uh, photo mask alignment is a very, very critical step. Basically, we may have several masks. Some can be used to generate patterns to be used in etching processes, and the other ones can be used in lift-off processes to make some electrode um, and metal electrodes, basically. Um, so the main point is that each layer has to be precisely and within specification aligned to the previous layer and subsequent layers. So even minor misalignments can ruin all the devices on your uh, wafer. In mask aligner, um, the square and uh, cross system is very common to be used in, for alignment marks. So the first reference marks are generated on the surface using the first photo mask. And then these will be used to align to um, subsequent layers using their complementary uh, alignment marks. So after exposure, it's time to remove the unwanted um, parts by dissolving it in developing solution. Basically, it's just chemical dissolution of unpolymerized um, resist in developer. Um, usually, alkaline solutions are used to develop uh, positive photoresist, and organic solutions are used to um, develop negative photoresist. And um, like the other types of fabrication, uh, basically, processes, the last step is inspection. Um, optical microscopes or laser-based uh, microscope can be used in this step. Um, the potential defect we are looking for are film delamination, surface cracking, particle contamination, or features distortion. And also, we need to check the dimension, the thickness uniformity for the, um, basically, photoresist film, and also the accuracy of the alignments. So, uh, from what we said so far, we can tell that photolithography, optical lithography, is a very common uh, technique that is used to print large area integrated devices. But it's got some limitations. Basically, the resolution of the conventional photolithography uh, technique is negatively affected by light diffraction. And this makes it difficult to use this technique when we are printing ultra-high density integrated devices. So here, um, I will give you a citation uh, on a paper from Ben Lim from 1986, who came up with this equation to basically show the factors that are affecting the minimum feature size and the critical dimension that can be achieved in this process. K is a process-related coefficient, um, and usually it is 0.8. Um, NA is numerical aperture with some instrumental development. We may achieve larger numerical aperture, and um, it can give us better resolution, um, but Another answer to the question of how we can print smaller features and patterns is basically to drive down the wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths experience um, less diffraction. That's why when we are dealing with printing high density integrated devices with fine features, extreme UV light lithography can be an extension of optical lithography. It uses very short wavelengths of 13 nanometer of light and um, specialized lenses made of um, curved mirrors and reflective coatings to print very fine features. So when for basically generating faster, cheaper, and smaller features and semiconductor parts, 
um, EU wheel can be a very good replacement um, for optical lithography. Of course, the lithography techniques are not limited to these two. There are different types of lithography processes and techniques available. Uh, for example, electron beam lithography uses accelerated electron, um, focusing on electron sensitive um, resist. And we can print um, uh, relatively good resolution patterns using this technique up to 20 nanometer. But if you want to compare it with um, optical lithography, it is much, much slower. And that's why it is mostly used in mask fabrication. Um, also, X-ray with wavelengths of 0.4 to 4 nanometer can be another source of uh, radiation for lithography. And um, comparing to EBIL, it is much faster. But um, on the other hand, um, the masks that are being used in this technique has to be made of low atomic number material, um, like diamond or beryllium, which is quite um, expensive. Um, so, in summary, we can say that there are many lithography techniques available, uh, and chip makers, based on the advantages and the limitations of these techniques, choose the best ones that suits their um, requirements and their manufacturing process. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. You've given yourself plenty of time for questions. <laughs> so, anybody have some questions for Marion? So you talked about the XY dimension in lithography and the resolution. What about the Z dimension, the thickness of the resist? In terms of the, oh, the, uh, the, the, the use of different thickness resists. Oh, okay. Um, yes, basically, I can bring up this. And you're doing so well with the kids behind you as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here. This table shows the difference between these two resists in terms of the basically resolution uh, that can be achieved. Um, and this is also related to the thickness of photoresist. So with uh, positive photoresist, we can um, create uh, thinner resist. The viscosity of the positive photoresist is quite uh, low. And uh, then uh, we can make smaller uh, features. But uh, there is limitation, com basically relatively to positive uh, resist. There is limitation with negative resist. But on the other hand, it depends on the application, basically. On the other hand, in some uh, applications, we may need to have thicker resist uh, for, for example, making molds and masters. And in these cases, we are going to use the negative resist. I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> so. What, what, what we're starting to see here is that uh, microfabrication is a multi-step process. And you need to think about what you're wanting to make before you start selecting all the steps and the resists and the technologies that you're going to use behind you. So I'd be suggesting that you speak to your colleagues, the experts that are around, like the ANFFSA team, that can help you with that. Because you don't want to go down a blind alley and make something that's wrong. It's expensive. Something. Do you want to step this way so that everyone can hear you oh, and, and the, uh, those online can hear you? <laughs> Try it. <laughs> um, so I have a question about spin coding. So, uh, as Simon was talking about, for thicker resists, from my understanding, you need a lower um, like revolution speed to achieve thicker resist when using spin coding. How does it compare like the surface, um, surface um, like I'd say flatness compared so to So like, not flatness? necessarily I would say. Um, it's basically you need to choose the right type of photoresist with the right viscosity and of course the polarity of it. And also the 
um, basically the uh, spinning speed. So for example, there are different types of negative photoresist and uh, with different viscosities. Um, if you go for very low spinning speed and um, with high viscosity resist, you may get you may not get very flat surface, and you will get like edge bead, and it is quite hard to work around it, and you won't get a very good uniformity in your film thickness. So it's about deciding and choosing the right type of photoresist. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I've previously done a lot of work with. Uh, at NFF in Queensland, and they do a dry film lamination yes. using a negative photoresist SUA. There, there yeah. is pros and cons in using like these sort of photoresist, the liquid ones and the um, dry ones. For example, the dry ones may not be as um, strong as the these ones when you want to do, I don't know, ma um, uh, PDMS casting. There, there is pros and cons in using of uh, these. But with a uh, dry, basically, film, you can get very good uniformity, of course. Yeah. But you limit it to whatever the thickness of that film is. Yes, yeah. that's correct. So with a, a liquid resist, you can mm -hmm. change it. But you still have to have a reasonable starting point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Else? Any other questions? apologise if anyone's asking questions online because I've got no idea how to do that. Um, I'll also take the opportunity here to highlight a resource that ANFF have online which is called ANFF Enlighten which is a lot of these micro and nano fabrication techniques laid down by the technical staff like Marion, like, like the rest of the team who spend a lot of time and effort to provide a resource for people to access this work. Um, you can simply type in ANFF Enlighten, it's free, all you've got to do is register and it's an opportunity for you to sort of look through these courses and do a quiz at the end as well if you want to. If there's no more questions, what I'm going to do is we'll put a pause here and we have an early lunch for 10 minutes early, then we'll start organising the industry tours. So we'll thank Marion in the usual way. Oh. I'm sure welcome to share these. Sure. <laughs> I will get some at the end. Sure. So, Thanks. Let's take a break for lunch then. <laughs>